Well, good evening and thank you for joining the Georgetown African American uh, Monument Project tonight. I'm not actually a representative of the organization. I'm, in, I'm invited to speak today. So uh, we'll hear more about that project at the end of my presentation. So we'll get started very soon. I'm sorry that we are starting a little bit late. The name of the presentation is Enslaved at the Georgetown Hotel, Three Generations of the Clark Family. About the background on this, um, the Clark family is related to me by, by um, affection, not necessarily by blood. The story came to me through a man that I knew all my life as Uncle Bobby, and he is the husband of my mother's first cousin. And through him, I learned about his history in Georgetown in DC, as he always said that his family lived in Georgetown for many generations. And because of that, and the interest that his daughters had in the history, I began to help them to do research into the Clark family history and uncovered the story of three generations who lived in Georgetown in one location and they were enslaved. So, oh, my slide, there we go. Just in terms of content, we're going to talk really about three families, the, the Clarks, the Dyers and the family of Eleanor Lang, who was the owner, the slave owner. We'll talk of, of the law that, about the law that emancipated them in 1862, the environment that they lived in in Georgetown, the process of the Emancipation Act, the petition process through which you, one can learn a lot about one's ancestors who lived during the time, and then the aftermath, what happened to the families after their emancipation. At the end of these, the presentation, we will entertain your questions, but you can add them to the Q&A um, throughout at any time that you have a question and they'll be read at the end of the presentation so that I can answer them. So Eleanor Ridgely Lang, born er Eleanor Ridgely Morgan in Maryland in 1789, she was the owner of the Georgetown Hotel in Georgetown. And she was also the owner of enslaved people who she employed at that location. Before she met, began met managing the Georgetown Hotel in 1834, she was an oyster seller and caterer in Georgetown. She was widowed uh, of John Lang, who also was in the oyster business in Georgetown. We, we see here an advertisement that was placed because the omnibuses used to stop in front of the hotel that she managed on M Street, what is now known as M Street, just west of Wisconsin. At that time, it was called Bridge Street and Wisconsin was called High Street. In 1824, as we can see from this bill of sale obtained from the DC archives, Eleanor Lang purchased one little girl named Mary, and she was a slave for life, sold to her by one of her neighbors, James Essex, and his mother, Deborah Essex. And she was sold for $900. And Mary was, it seemed to be part of a group that Deborah had passed on to James for $1. It may have been one, um, uh, one family but it's not clear, of course, because that was not recorded in that transfer. And Deborah had basically given her son, James, this, these, these five individuals for $1 out of her love for him is what the document said. But one year later, James sold the little girl in that group, Mary, to Eleanor Lang. One year later, Eleanor Lang purchased another child and in this case, the child's name was Marianne, and this bill of sale indicates that she is a Negro girl and a slave for life. Now, she purchased this child for $200 and from a man named William Mulberry. And William Mulberry also was a resident of Georgetown. In fact, his house is still there on M Street. It is now the Ukrainian embassy. The Mulberrys, they were a wealthy family. And William's family also had a plantation or in, in Prince George County in an area called Piscataway. One of the things I notice about this bill of sale is that Marianne, uh, this purchase was made $200 and 
Eleanor Lang gave to William Marbury on February 13th, 1825. But if you look on the right hand margin, you see that the child was not delivered to Eleanor Lang until November, 1825, nine months later. Later in the records, we can see that Marianne was born in Maryland. So it is possible that it just took that long to take Marianne from her family in Maryland and bring her to live in Georgetown with Eleanor. William Marbury also is famous in the history of the US, excuse me, Miss. He is, um, was in a case before the Supreme Court in 1803 or in the very early days of the court, Marbury versus Madison. And anyone who goes to law school hears about that case early on because that's what established many important principles including the principle of judicial review. His photo is there in the lower right hand corner. So now the girls were living in Georgetown with Eleanor Lang, the oyster seller and the caterer and working for her. And just wanna talk a little bit about what was the environment for them at the time. At the time, DC was really a major, major slave trading market. The slave trade is particularly from the states that neighbored the District of Columbia to the Southern states and some of the Northern states where slavery had not yet been at law. Um, movement of people was a big business in the District of Columbia. There were slave pens, at least six, just between the White House and the Capitol building and many more going west from the White House and into Georgetown. Here, this broadside that you see, or part of one, was published by um, an abolitionist organization because the abolitionist movement was very involved in the situation in DC and calling constantly for the end of slavery. There were constant debates and constant abolition movement, but at the same time, the Southern states were pushing to be able to, con to continue their institution and their business. All black people in the Washington DC, and particularly in, in, in Georgetown, were subject to the black codes laws, uh, regulations that applied only to black people and enslaved people. They lived certainly under disparate justice at the time. As, and we, I think sometimes we still, it still looks that way. Um, so in, in the end, their infractions could be anything. And this here is just an example of that they could be whipped basically for sitting on a bench or a stall in the market house. So these were the just typical horrendous conditions that not only enslaved people, but also the free black people, of which there were many, that each, in each, every 10 years, when you look at the census record, you see an increasing number of free black people living in Georgetown. There were always a significant number of African-Americans in the population of Georgetown. In 1800, when Georgetown was founded, most were enslaved, but by 1845, as we see here in the state, most were free but they could be re-enslaved or enslaved even if they never had been for any type of infraction. For debt, they could be sold for their debts into slavery. And, the, and that wasn't unusual. These things did happen um, and there are many newspaper accounts of it. I'm just going to read, I talked about the abolition movement and just um, to read a little bit of some of the types of petitions that were entered into what was then like the congressional record and here's just a quote in 1829 that someone submitted to Congress about the situation. And it says here, scarcely a week passes with some, without some of these wretched creatures being driven through our streets. After having been confined, sometimes manacled in a loathsome prison, they are turned out in public view to take their departure for the South. The children, some of the women are generally crowded into a cart while the others follow on foot not unfrequently handcuffed and chained together. To those who have never seen a spectacle of this, of this kind, no description can give an adequate idea of its horrors. And this is what Mary and Marianne saw during their lives in Georgetown. So while Marianne and Mary were living with Eleanor, as working with her as the oyster seller and caterer, down the street, there was a place called McCandless Tavern. It is the location that became the Georgetown Hotel and is now known as the City Tavern in Georgetown. But it was also one of the, the locations well known 
for being involved in the slave trade. Its manager, George McCandless, is listed in numerous articles from the early 19, 1820s to his death, 1833, as being a place, an individual, and the, and the manager of a tavern, the McCandless Tavern, where slave traders would meet and where slave traders would, would uh, seek slaves. They would advertise, as you see here, I wish to purchase 50 Negroes from the age of 10 to 25 years of age. Also, sometimes there would be ads for runaways, for fugitives. And the, uh, the ads or the notices for them was that you can turn them over to Mr. McCandless at the tavern. This is the location that was later purchased by Eleanor Lang. Now, George McCandless died in 1833. And his associate, Owen, Owen Connolly, began to manage it for one year. And during that time, there were some ads placed by um, a business, a, tra a slave trading business called Birch and Jones. And Birch and Jones advertised that they were, that was one of the locations, one of the many taverns in DC where they could be found for their slave trading business. But Owen Connolly placed ads saying that they had no business, no longer had business with Birch and Jones since the death of George McCandless. Now this implies that George McCandless had, had, was involved with Birch and Jones's business. Doesn't necessarily say that Connolly was not involved with any other slave traders. But I just wanted to point out that Birch and Jones, Birch at least, you have probably heard of Mr. Birch, if you saw 12 Years um, a, of a 12 Years in Slave by about Solomon Northrop because Bert, Solomon Northrop was kidnapped in Washington, DC and he was sold to Birch. And it was Birch who penned him and beat him and then sold him to move south to Louisiana. Now in 1834, Eleanor Lang purchased the place known as McCandless Tavern and she renamed it the Georgetown Hotel. And this is an ad that she placed. Now hotel was considered a more upscale name than tavern. And so perhaps Eleanor wanted to attract a different type of crowd to her establishment. And here she is advertising that, that she has renovated the place and that there's fine food and fine accommodations. Now, Eleanor, as we mentioned in 1824 and 1825, purchased two young girls. Um, those girls though had children. And for Eleanor's perspective as a businesswoman, this was an investment and these, those children were her dividends. This increased Eleanor's net worth. So I made note of the, that increase and we can see from that, the two girls in 1825, they became three in 1830. In 1840, they were seven. In 1850, they were still counted as seven. And there was, only, there was only one female in the household over 30 at that time. So it appears that one of the Marys was no longer there. And then in 1860, there were nine. And that's important as we get to 1862 for Eleanor. Because in, on April 16, 1862, the District of Columbia Compensated Emancipation Act was signed by Abraham Lincoln. And it immediately freed everyone who was enslaved in the District of Columbia. So there wasn't a period of time where, well, as there had been in most of the Northern states, there was not an immediate emancipation, some period of time after some number of years, uh, those that were enslaved would be, would be emancipated, but no, here it was immediate. So Abraham Lincoln, he waited some days to sign the act too, because there was a lot of consternation among the slave owners in DC that, oh wow, immediately we're going to lose our unpaid labor so the unpaid labor, unfortunately, they had some delay in their immediate emancipation to make it more comfortable for the enslavers. Now, this is the only case of the United States also where enslavers were compensated by the government for the freed, for having lost their unpaid labor, for having lost the people they were enslaving. And there was a petition process to follow. In order to qualify for compensation, the enslaver had to be loyal to the union and they had to set, sign an oath that they, were, that they were and they had to file a petition within 90 days. The law allowed about an average of $300 for each of the, each of the slaves 
And that was a low amount compared to what they would have been able to sell these individuals for prior to 1862, basically prior to 1861, prior to the Civil War. And it's important that the Civil War had started because as I mentioned before, for decades in Congress, they had been debating this issue of, emancipa of emancipation in the District of Columbia. At 1862, they were no longer the Southern representatives because they had seceded from the Union and they no longer were sending members to Congress. So that therefore there was then a majority of individuals who were in favor of emancipation and they were able to pass the DC Compensated Emancipation Act easily. So the, so the petition process began and there were about 3,100 individuals emancipated immediately by the act. And there were- I can't hear her. About 2,989 of them. There were some though, some of these enslavers who did not file petitions and recognizing that there was a gap in June, 1862, Congress approved a supplemental act to the Compensation Act. And it's important because it allowed actually the people who had been enslaved to file petitions on their own behalf. Now, while there were only a few that benefited from this, they are among the only individuals in the United States that received comp any type of compensation for having been enslaved from the government. And it's an important principle that was established that they could testify, make their own testimony on their behalf and even against their enslavers. So here's the petition process. And from the petition, one can learn a lot about the enslaved people. And as we also know, for, for the history of people who were enslaved in the United States, it's very hard to get details about their lives and, and, and a description. Here though in DC, there are detailed records about those who were, in, who were emancipated in 1862. On the screen, you'll see the first page of the petition filed by Eleanor Lang with the help of her attorney. And it lists the names of, of the, 10 the 10 individuals that were enslaved in her house. Now one is Mary Dyer, age 48. And that is one of the girls that she had purchased in 18, the one she had purchased in 1824. We don't see Mary Ann because Mary Ann, we don't know what happened to Mary Ann. There's no information about it. Uh, Eleanor could not receive compensation because Eleanor was no longer in her household. Perhaps she had died, perhaps she'd been sold, perhaps she'd been emancipated another way, we don't know. But I do believe she wasn't living and we'll see why later. Then there are the Clarks and these are actually the offspring. Lizzie and Henry Clark, the two other adults in the household, these are Marianne's children. And then below that, we see George Dyer, who's Mary's son, and then the rest of those, those who are children, 16 and under, are children of Lizzie Clark, Mary Ann's daughter. We see a good description, we see the color, their height, their age. So we learn, we're already learning a bit about them. But on the next page, we learn more. Here, the enslaver often, well, the enslaver wanted to give a more of a description, which would be typical if the enslaver was selling an individual they had in, into slavery to another enslaver, they would want to beef up the value, the quality of the individual they were selling. So here we get some information about the skills of each of, the, of these people that she's selling and what she believes to be their value. But what's even more important in the history of this is on the top paragraph is how we learn how Eleanor acquired these individuals, how they came to be enslaved by her. And it's through that information on the top paragraph that I knew where and when that they were purchased. And so I could find those original bills of sale. And that's not always easy to find in our history. So we also see what, uh, that they were house servants. Uh, excellent cook was Mary Dyer. Um, George, we see, he was um, a clerk even. Lizzie Clark, a chambermaid in the hotel. Another thing that we see on here is in interesting information about how Eleanor had used her property, had leveraged her property actually to gain more. She actually used these people enslaved to get a loan. They were her collateral. And here this lower paragraph makes note of that. 
that in 1858, that Eleanor had taken out a loan from Peter von Essex using the enslaved people as collateral. Now, of course, she had to make a note of this because she was about to be compensated, but Peter von Essex had a claim to some amount of money because of the loan. So and they were there to secure that debt. Let's, you also notice here that Eleanor Lang was not literate. You can see that she, in everything she signs with an X, which I thought was interesting to a woman in business on her own, a widow, and she was not literate. Here's some more information about that collateral. And this is from the registration of the loan that is um, in DC archives as well. Now, if Eleanor did not make payment on that loan to Peter von Essex, he could take possession of the collateral. In other words, take possession of those individuals who were enslaved. And he could do with them whatever he choose to do, would choose to do. He could sell them at public or private sale at his discretion. And this is not unusual. There are many newspaper ads about the sale of enslaved people saying that they were seized to pay a debt of the enslaver. So our clocks and dyers were living with this threat over their heads too that if Eleanor could not pay her bills, that they, could, that they might be the ones to suffer separation, movement to the South, to even worse conditions. So in the petition process, the enslaver had to get an appraise, appraisal of the individuals to see what um, an, their private appraiser would consider to be the value. And here we see that Eleanor hired someone to make this appraisal, and here's the value that that appraiser suggested for the family, the Dyer and the Clark families, for her compensation, not for their value, of course. Now, part of this process, too, was that the enslaved, even though they were no longer enslaved, they were immediately compensated. They had nothing to gain monetarily from this. But part of the process is that the commission who had to approve these petitions had to actually inspect these individuals. Now the inspection was cursory. They had to really make sure that they existed because they wouldn't want to pay for people who don't exist. But these, now these individuals had to report to the commission, but they were no longer enslaved. So what were they getting out of it? It was important to them to have their emancipation documented because Slavery was not finished. This was 1862 in the District of Columbia. It was during the Civil War and certainly the slave trade between the Union and the Confederacy was not in place, but there were still slave states surrounding the District of Columbia. In fact, in, in Maryland and in Delaware, those were still slave states. So they could be considered slaves and the Fugitive Slave Act was still in place. They might at any time have to prove that they were free. So it was important to them to, for this petition process to be concluded and that it be documented by the commission. So this record is just showing that they did appear at the commission. Another part of the process was the enslaver had to publish in the newspaper notices, and these were published many, many days, um, showing what their claim was. And this was basically so anyone who was reading about this and who could have a counterclaim or had information to indicate that there was something untrue about the claim being made could report that information to the commission. So in the newspaper, you could find again, everyone listed and the proposed values. And here's a copy just from June, 1862 in the National Republican, a special supplement to make this list. So finally, the government makes a decision, takes a look at what the enslaver says is the value and has their own um, appraiser that they've hired to make an appraisal. And we see that there, the second column in handwritten a little lighter is what their appraiser has said. And then the commission makes up their mind actually what will be the payment and that's in the last column. So in fact, although she had claimed 7,000 was the value for the 10 individuals she had enslaved, the commission gave her $3,453, which was a sizable amount in 1862. 
So life went on for the Clark and Dyers after they were emancipated in 1862. And what happened? You know, some people wonder, well, what did, what did the freed people do? Did they continue to work for their enslavers in the District of Columbia? And the research has found in most cases, they did not. In most cases, they moved away and made their own lives. Because in the District of Columbia, there was already a vibrant African-American community. There, most people at the time in 1862, 80% of the African-Americans who lived in the District of Columbia were free people. And there were only these 3,100 remaining enslaved individuals who then were, were emancipated and joined that community. Schools had already been established. There were already African-American congregations within their own churches in Georgetown and other parts of the district. So in this case, the Dyers and the Clarks decided to move on and make their way elsewhere, continuing to live in Georgetown. Now in the 1860s, of course, the Civil War was still raging until 1865. And what they saw going on was that DC was growing rapidly. And there was actually a lot of, a lot of employment opportunities in DC and the surrounding areas. There were many factories that, uh, that had to build munitions. So there, there were opportunities like that. There were, for women who mainly did domestic work, there were opportunities there because the city again was growing. There were stores for clerks. There were the ports were very active. So there were many opportunities. And so in the case of the Dyers and Clarks, they saw no reason to continue working at the Georgetown Hotel. But it seems that Eleanor Lang did okay because even in 1863, she bought the neighboring building. So she didn't seem to hurt so much for losing her free labor. Here we just see some of the scenes and things that were going on in the area at the time after their emancipation. Of course, there were always troops. There were many refugees, people fleeing slavery in the South during the war, moving into the area. And, and there was also just an example they saw with these refugees that Freedman's Village was established across the river in Arlington from where they lived. So what happened to the family? They went to live in Georgetown. They stayed there and they went to live on Dumbarton Street. They lived there from the, the directory showed them living there early on and working in different occupations. George Dyer, he was uh, working as a feed salesman. Perhaps he was a feed salesman at the Alfred Lee Feed and Grain Store, an African-American owned business that had been long standing and a large and, and very successful business at 29th and M Street. And uh, he was a prominent Georgetowner. And so as a feed store, it's a, there's a good chance that George Dyer, who was a good clerk, according to Eleanor Lang, that he was employed there. In the 1867 directory, George Dyer, he was, uh, was employed as an exchange officer. And I believe that that was George Alfred Dyer, the husband of Mary Dyer. And because George Dyer also, another George Dyer, was at the same address at 28th and Barton Street, and he was the one employed as a clerk. So what we do see later on that Mary Dyer is listed as a widow, but most excitingly in 1869, as we see on this slide, Mary Dyer purchased that home on Dumbarton Street where they were living. She purchased it at an auction as reported in the newspaper for 800, looks like $750, that's a dollar sign. And that was where the family would, be, would continue to live for many years. And seven years after being emancipated, Mary Dyer, in her own right, becomes a homeowner in Georgetown. Life continued. We see here in the federal census in 1870 that the family is all living together. I'm going to just close this out. Is all living together at the home on Dumbarton Street with Mary Dyer here shown as the owner. Home value of about $1,800. And she also has another $200. Um, and then we see the, where the family's working. One of the Clarks, William Henry Clark, notice he is a barber, which is a very good skill in the 1860s. There was very good money to be made as a barber at that time. The other children, Alfred and Maria, are still in the house. The youngest children that, who are on the petition are not there. And given the high rate of child mortality, there is a good chance that those children were, no, were not living at the time. We also, the family was also growing. They were starting to marry. Eliza Clark, 
there, she did marry a man named Sidney Sims in 1874 when she was 24 years old. And Sidney was from Virginia. And he, at the time they married, he was a coachman, but soon later he was hired by the federal government as a civil servant. And he was employed at the Department of the Interior as a copyist. And to be a copyist, think about that. There were no photocopier machines. They actually needed human hands to write out to make copies of documents. And he did that. So that would imply that he was highly literate to have had that, that degree, that type of job. And that was really a path to the middle class to get a white collar job with the federal government. Then 1875, Alfred and Jenny were married. Jenny Cole, also from, not from Georgetown necessarily, but also from DC. They were married in the Roman Catholic Church and many of the African-Americans in Georgetown were, were Catholic because Catholic Catholic Church dominated Georgetown, as you know, with the university. And the Trinity Church is one of the oldest churches, Catholic Church is perhaps the oldest Catholic Church in the district. And they did allow Blacks to worship there and to marry there, although there was segregation in the church. At that time, um, Alfred was listed as a stevedore, probably in the Georgetown dock. Now this photo was passed down to my cousin's family as a photo of Alfred Clark. Again, he's the son of Lizzie Clark or Elizabeth Clark and the grandson of Marianne who was purchased from George Marbury. In the petition, we learned that Marianne's last name was Lingen. He was 10 years old when he was emancipated in 1862 and the petition said he was, his value was $500 and that he was a house servant when he was 10 years old. So we don't know the parents. Uh, we know Lizzie Clark, we don't know his father. We don't know the father of any of uh, the children of Elizabeth Clark, whether they had the same father or there was, it was more than one father. She had about six, six children over a significant period of time. But um, it was passed on also that he, that he had very much the appearance of uh, you know, European background, European men. So he's clearly of mixed race. And some say, is this his photo or is this perhaps his own father's photo? But here we see another photo of him as a handsome young man in a locket and there with his wife, Jenny Cole. For many years, they lived on Volta Street, which is where they started their family, Volta Street in Georgetown. And there's a photo of Volta Street, which at the time was considered an, an alley where many of the African-Americans lived. But um, now we see all of those homes have a great value. <laughs> so things went on and in the, we see that there are deaths in the family and older brother to Alfred, William H. Clark, he died in 1885, 34 years old. We see that the funeral was at the residence of his aunt, Mary Dyer, at 27 Dumbarton Street, the same at her home. And we notice that it says aunt. Now, Mary Dyer was purchased in 1824 and Marianne was purchased in 1825. They were both 14 when they were purchased and they must have been become sisters. After all, they lived together, worked together and had their families and the children together. So they really must have had a sense of being one family. We also noticed that back in 1850, it appears that Mary Ann was no longer in the household, but her children, her grandchildren were still fairly young at that time. And Mary Dyer, again, may have been like a mother to Mary Ann's children. And so therefore the children as they, as they grew, they had a closer and closer family relationship as we see. Unfortunately, though, the following year, in 1886, Mary Dyer herself dies. The newspaper account said that she fell on the corner of 3rd and D Streets. And her funeral also was at the historic Mount Zion Methodist Church in West Washington, which was another term for Georgetown in that era. And that Mount Zion Methodist Episcopal Church is an historic church. It's the oldest uh, African-American congregation uh, for the Methodist church 
in the District of Columbia, and it was just around the corner from their home. So her funeral was there, and then a week later, her will was read, and we see that Mrs. Marianne Dyer, she left to her real estate consisting of her home on Dumbarton Street to marry E. Dyer, who was her daughter-in-law, because her son had passed away, her son George had passed away, but her daughter-in-law continued to live with her. Ella Jane Stewart, which was a granddaughter of Marianne Lingen, Alfred Clark, Eliza Ann Sims, who was born Clark, Mary Jane Stewart, who was also one of the Clarks, he had married a Stewart and was then a widow, and Elizabeth Clark, and that was a, a daughter the daughter of Marianne Lingen. So she also asked that the property be sold after one year. And the former, meaning her daughter-in-law, Mary Dyer, to receive $2,000. The former, I guess the former to receive, the former to receive $2,000 each. I suppose she expected that there would be enough money out of the sale for $2,000 for, for each of those listed. And then Elizabeth Clark, to um, receive the see the remainder of the property. So from that eight hundred and or six seven hundred and fifty dollars she paid, they, the property must have appreciated significantly in that time for her to have considered the value to be what, what she expected her her heirs to receive. So we move on into eighteen the eighteen nineties, and the family continues living there at the home. Um, there is no sense, federal census for that year for us to see exactly how, how the family was distributed in Georgetown because the census, there was a census taken, but the records were lost in a fire. So we can't see that. But we do know from other records, some of the things that went on in the family. For example, Stuart Valentine Clark was born on February 14th, 1893. And he, um, Alfred, Alfred, he's Alfred's son. And Alfred and Jenny had 12 children, and he was their ninth child, born in 1893. See that he was born February 14th, and you see what his middle name is, and you know why. So there's a photo there of Dumbarton in Wisconsin Avenue in the 1890s. And again, this was the neighborhood, this was a hub in the neighborhood, and this is a site that the family would have seen living there. In 1896, his aunt, Mary Jane Stewart, was still living in the home in Dumbarton Street. She was actually the eldest at, of the children that at that time, and she was a widow, but she was also a complainant and a witness against John William, who she accused of stealing two chickens from the yard at the, at the house, and he was held on a $500 bond. Unfortunately, though, two years later, Mary Jane Stewart died in the home and her, fun her funeral was held on December 26, one day after Christmas at the Berrien Baptist Church. So that must have been a sad Christmas in 1898 for the family. Then in 1990, 1900, I'm sorry. Again, we have a federal census record here and it shows us who's living at the, in the home on Dumbarton Street. And Eliza Sims then is the head of the household, living with her as her son and her nephews, Mary, Mary, her sister Mary Jane's children, Charles, Ella, and Marie, but also living as a couple of Alfred's children. Now they had 12 children, so if a couple of them decided to move into this larger house on Dumbarton Street with their aunt Eliza. So also we learned some other things about the neighborhood. Across the street is the Epiphany Roman Catholic Church, and that is the oldest African-American black congregation. And it was established because some um, African-Americans were not, no longer willing to suffer the segregation in the Trinity Church, and they established their own church. Eliza, though, had, uh, lost her, had lost her husband in 1888, and we see his tombstone there. And sadly, she lost her son as well in 1911. And they are both buried in the Holy Rood Cemetery, a Roman Catholic cemetery located in Upper Georgetown on Wisconsin Avenue. Also in this, in this, sorry, in this decade, Alfred's wife, Jenny, died. And this is the newspaper notice. And she died in 1918. 
The newspaper notice should list her children and the funeral information at, at, at Holy Trinity Church, but it also notes that she was a member of a mutual aid society called the Ladies of Olive Immediate Relief. And they have also here announced her funeral. So the family, as we see, continued at 27 Dumbarton Street, many members of the family. And then in 1925, they sold that. Here is the bill of sale. And it describes the heirs that were still living. And that was both Elizabeth and Alfred um, and, and, the widow Mary, and the widow Mary Dyer, the widow of George Dyer. And there were some of the grandchildren of Mary Jane Stewart who received some of the proceeds of the sale in 1925. So obviously they did not do as senior Mary Dyer had wished and sell the house after one year. Then in the 1920s, we were still losing members of the, of the families. Alfred Clark, just a month after the sale of the house died in 1925, just one month after that house on Dumbarton Street was sold on June 6, 1925. And he's buried in Holywood Cemetery. For many years after his wife, Jenny, died in 1918, Alfred placed notices in the newspaper in memoriam to his beloved wife. And he probably joined her at this, in the same grave at Holyrood. Eliza, the very next year in, in 1926, the last of that generation emancipated from Eleanor Lang's Georgetown Hotel. She also died. Tragically, she was hit by a car right near her home on 13th Street. And a couple of days later, she died in the hospital. Her funeral is announced as well in the newspaper, but we also see many other announcements about that funeral from other association societies that Eliza belonged to. She belonged to the Golden Leaf Whispering Hope Society. She was a member of the Eastern Star Immediate Aid. And she was also the charter, a charter member and ex-vice president of the Ladies Crispus Addicts Association. And that was a mutual aid association. So we see Eliza, who was about 13 years old when she was emancipated from Eleanor Lang's Georgetown Hotel. She became very active, member of the middle class, African-American middle class in the District of Columbia, but died tragically at age 74 from a car accident. Moving forward, the next generation of Alfred's children. We saw that Eliza's children did not, her son did not survive. But Alfred's children, he had many with his wife, Marie Stevenson Clark. And here's a photo of, of Alfred with his wife, Marie, and three of their children. So George Dyer Clark, we notice that, that he is named after um, George Dyer, who was the husband, Al George Alfred was the husband of Mary Dyer, and as well as she had her son by that name, that he was, he was a homeowner on N Street, 2230 N Street. This is his draft registration in 1833. And Stuart Valentine Clark, he purchased a home, his home at 1837 Swan Street. And this again is his registration, World War I. And uh, he owned that home of the family, stayed in the family until just maybe about five years ago when the, after the last of his children passed away, well, not the last, one of the one of the, the one who was residing there and stayed in stayed in the home and then the family did sell the house, but it did stay in their home for a long time, just like the Dumbarton Street stayed in the home, stayed in the family for a long time. Now here are more of Alfred's descendants. This is these are the descendants of his son Stuart, and you can see Stuart Clark on the in the right hand photo there, the el the older man with the glasses holding one of his grandchildren, and he there is surrounded by his children and grandchildren here. His wife and mother-in-law are also in the photo. His sister, Bessie, is sitting just there in front of him with the glasses, with the glasses on. So they remained a close family. 
These are some more of Alfred and Jenny's children in these photos, his wife in the, in the, sitting in the chair. And then finally, here is uh, Uncle Bobby with his wife at Minto and two of their children, Uncle Bobby's wife, Marie. But I must say this is dedicated now to Uncle Bobby's memory. Although I started giving this talk in February and he was still feeding me information. Unfortunately, at the end of July, one day after his 70th wedding anniversary, Uncle Bobby went to join the ancestors. So this is in his, his memory. So here's my last slide. Um, and these are some of the sources, just a few of the sources that I have used. And I will open it up for questions because we're running short on time. So I think someone is going to feed me the questions. Yes, okay, so now we're going to move to the question and answer portion. All right, so the first question we have is, did you say some of the formerly enslaved received compensation? <laughs> I guess they want you to speak more to that. Uh, yes, I did, because, because they, they created a supplement to the act, to the original Compensated Emancipation Act, because they recognized that some people who were enslaved were not going to be able to have their emancipation documented because the enslavers were not filing a petition. So this supplement allowed those individuals to file for themselves and therefore they were filing the petition themselves to document their emancipation. And in those cases, in some of those cases, not all of the case, not in all cases when those petitions were filed by formerly enslaved people, but in many of those cases, yes, individuals actually receive compensation for themselves. Okay, someone else asked if uh, any members of the family were members at Mount Zion UMC. I can't say that I'm certain. Um, the fact that their funerals will, were held there and that Mount Zion was just a couple of blocks from their home and that they seem that a couple of them are buried at Mount Zion's cemetery implies to me that they were likely members of Mount Zion Church. Not all of them, but it seems that some of them were probably members. Okay, another question is, uh, were the clippings that you used, did they come from black newspapers? In most cases, no. I think I found um, a couple of clip clippings in the Washington Bee archives, but most of these clippings were from the Evening Star, the National Intelligencer, the Alexandria Gazette, and a couple of other newspapers, especially going back further into the 19th century. The earlier into the 19th century, the more varied the newspapers were. But there are many different archives to check for these clippings. Okay, another question is, uh, what year was Trinity Church established? I can say that right now at the moment I remember. Um, I can look and see if I have it in my notes, but it is not at the top of my memory at the moment. I'm afraid, but if I find it, I will tell you. <laughs> okay, the last question we have here is, were Eastern Star and uh, Crispus Attic's female auxiliaries to Prince Hall Freemasonry? Eastern Star was, certainly. I, I believe the Crispus Attic's Association, I don't know for sure. It seems to have been a mutual aid association. I did notice there's still a chapter of this in York, Pennsylvania. I couldn't find any other history to see if it was associated with any other organization, other established organization. Though, but certainly the Eastern Star is um, an off, offshoot of them, is, is the female auxiliary of the Masons. Okay, well, those are all the questions we have. I well, believe... good, and I think um, there are some other comments to be made now by, you can turn it over. <laughs> Thank you very much for this be my contact information and feel free to send me any question or comments as you'd like. And thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you very much, Yvette. Um, and now we're gonna turn it over to Ms. Andrina Crockett. Good evening. And thank you for your interest in the Georgetown African American Historic Landmark Project. My name is Andrina Crockett and I am the founder and CEO of the project. I would like to thank Yvette 
Lacan III for her informative, well-researched, and comprehensive presentation. She mentioned a little bit about herself, but there's more. I want to say that Ms. Lacan III retired from a lengthy career in the United States government where she held senior positions in immigration, international affairs, and homeland security. Yvette has a BA in mass communications and a minor in history from the State University of New York at Buffalo and a master's degree in public administration from Baruch College. She serves on the board of directors of Reading Partners DC and is a member of the advisory board of Migrants, Immigrants, and Refugee Rights Alliance. She is an avid family historian. Her work has been published in the Annals of Genealogy Research and The Cutter, a magazine of the Foundation for Coast Guard History. Once again, Ms. Lagantri, thank you so very much. I'm going to move and briefly just give a little background of the history of the project, which entails installing 20 bronze markers throughout Georgetown on public space, thus turning Georgetown into a virtual immersive museum experience. The logo, which is featured, um, which, which you see, on the slide, uh, many of you recognize the outside circumference as being the Dinkra symbol for Sankofa. Go back to your past and learn from it. The inside circumference is Nia Orinum, meaning he who does not know can know through learning. And the central Dinkra symbol is Mutapo, which means reconciliation. For those of you who joined us last month, we featured Yaro Mammoth, who enslaved for 44 years at age 60, earned enough money to purchase property in Georgetown, build a house, own stock in the Georgetown Bank of Columbia, and eventually his great-grandson attended Harvard University. For anybody who is on this or registered for this and last month, we're going to put everybody's name in a drawing and gift someone with from slave ships to Harvard. This book should be on everyone's bookshelf. Um, also, I wanted to mention that recordings will be uploaded to Asala TV. For those of you who are unfamiliar, uh, Asala is the study of African American life and history. Um... Before I leave, I also want to thank the community. The project also entails uh, these markers going on 20 plus buildings with significant historical information on African American, both enslaved and free uh, African Americans in Georgetown. They include places like Georgetown University, Tudor Place, hopefully Trinity, um, Trinity, Holy Trinity Church, and uh, Holy Ruin. Um, the thanks, the other thanks I want to acknowledge are those who have already given consent. They include the First Baptist Church, uh, Marshall, uh, Armstrong Marshall, Jerusalem Baptist, Yvonne Labadi, um, Christian Fellows, Javid Ahmed, uh, 
Dominica Batier, um, Andre, Andriana Ocampa, and George Will Foundation, who currently occupies Dr. Fleet's home on 30th Street. Um, before I turn it over to Lewis Hicks, I would like to wish everyone a happy holiday. Be safe. Be healthy, and I'll see you in the new year. All right, Andrina. Thank you so much. I'd like to um, also thank Miss Yvette Lagantri for this wonderful presentation. It was fascinating. Uh, if you're like me, you're a history lover, um, you realize that history does not come cheap. As a matter of fact, it, there is an expense to this. Andrina's done a Holt Yeoman's job in pulling these uh, presentations together, as well as also the markers. Um, we have uh, contact information that I'd like to share my screen with you. And uh, that information um, you can uh, see. Um, hopefully, um, the website is www.gaahlp.org. You can email Andrina with any amount. Um, we might suggest uh, $25, but any amount is always appreciated. You can email uh, her with any additional information you like, or you can call her on 202 765 six nine three five or check out the website and uh, she would be glad to um, receive any amount of money thank you so much for joining us tonight and we look forward to you joining us in january <laughs>